No, Gotta have something to write with. I don't have one for you everybody. Got to write with? No. No, I don't know. You gotta bring it on there. This is a basic little primer on anti lock brakes. You know, just a little something to give you an idea of what you're dealing with when you deal with anti lock brakes. Okay, it's an overview. There will be a test at the end, so pay attention. Okay, right here, there's a little video there. You see the little video? What's going on there? Fly. He's sliding down, he's sliding down, he's sliding down. He's going to put his foot out of the end try to stop it there. Oh, no, he can't do it. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, he's figuring out. He's trying to stop it. Nothing you can do to stop it, you know? Now, if it had been, <laughs> if he'd have been sliding into the car with that door open his leg out, that would have been bad news. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was between the cars. I didn't see the smash the But uh, <laughs> by pump, by the, when driving on slippery roads, never lock your wheels when trying to stop. <laughs> If you try to stop when, you, when you're when you on slippery roads and you turn your wheels and they're sliding, you just keep going straight. If you're on wet pavement or ice, but if you're if the wheels are still rolling, they'll actually try to move the car. A tire roll with friction provides maximum braking with vehicle control, a tire using a sliding friction. How many of you guys have ever been driving a vehicle and you hit the brakes and the, tire, and the brakes locked up and it felt like the car got going faster? I mean, it feels like it picks up speed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, whenever it's, whenever you're, now I'm not talking about sliding on dry pavement, I'm talking about when you're on a wet road. Yeah. It, like it, it actually feels like you're going faster. Well, the vehicle, if you pump the brakes on a slippery surface, it maintains the traction without loss of vehicle control. But it's hard to do that when you're in a panic mode. You know, you just want to keep your foot locked on the brake. You know, because your sensibility is saying, don't let off the brake, you dodo. All right. ECU is going to calculate the pair of wheel speed. The brakes are going to be applied. Brake pressure transmits the calipers in the wheel cylinders, and all the brakes are activated. If there ain't no wheel lock up, it stops. That's the way it works, right? Simple as that. But if it sees a wheel locking up, it closes the inlet valve to block the pressure. Now, the inlet valve keeps the fluid from getting to the disc or the caliper, I mean, or the wheel cylinder, or whatever on the wheel that's locking up. You know, a four wheel anti lock brakes will have, you know, Whole group. If it's if you got rear wheel anti lock and if you and the front's got each uh, channel operating separately and the back is just going to the whole rear end, you know sometimes you'll just have three channels that way. But anyway, it closes the end of the valve and block the pressure. If the wheel is still locking up, see it traps that fluid there so that no more can get to it. And then it opens the outlet valve to dump some pressure. All right. It continues machine gunning the solenoids and using the pump when it's needed until a crisis is averted. So basically, you're going to, and you were talking about whenever you hit some gravel the other day, you felt your brake pedal go did, 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 like that, and it was totally wild because you weren't used to that at all. And I'll tell you, I was, uh, I used to work on this anti lock brake stuff, and like on a four wheel drive, like a, a Jeep Cherokee or something, I'd go out there and get on a dirt road. And I'd get me up some speed to make sure the ABS was going to work. And I'd stand on the brakes. And on a four-wheel drive, it would go, <laughs> you know, it feels like that. But I got out there one time on a slick road with a Ford Probe. And those wheel speed sensors are $200 a piece. It's a real, it's a sports car kind of ABS system. And it was a wide road out there. It was raining. I could tell the road was really slick. And I hit about 60 miles an hour, 65. And I stood on the brake because there wasn't no other cars around. Let's go see what it would do. And it went, boom. Like it was on dry pavement. It was a totally different feel on a four wheel drive than it is on a sporty car. Right? All right, this is the Magnificent Seven. This is some puppies that my daddy had over there. <laughs> I just figured I'd show you all the Magnificent Seven. You know, one, oh, two, three, you. four, five, six, seven. They did a little puppy dog. They'd already grown up and everything, you know. He used to feed them cornmeal and then let them out and run around on the yard, and the ones that got out of the road eliminated themselves. And you wind up in the smart ones, you know. All right, so how does the ECU know what the wheels are doing? It's got this sensor here. Now, what you got here was you got this mag that magnetic field that's represented by those two ovals. Well, you got this wire wrapped around this magnet, and it's going over here, and it's producing a signal that looks like that. This is a variable reluctance type sensor right here. And every time that one of those wheels goes by that magnet, it shifts that magnetic field. And when you shift a magnetic field across copper windings, it creates voltage that wasn't there before. So you can actually take a piece of copper winding and pass a magnet by it, and if you got a voltmeter on it or a scope, you'll see, you'll see that going on. All right, this right here is kind of what it looks like on the car. You got your signal wire going over there. Now, be aware of the fact that whenever you're working on an ABS system and throwing ABS codes, you're turning the wheels all the time. It's always bending those wires, right? 
And occasionally you'll see one that's bent the wires enough to where the wire will be in two, and you'll get a code for that particular sensor. Okay? Justin did that at the corner place down in Crestview the other day. He said they gave him one, had an ABS code, and he didn't want to put a part on there that might not fix the car, so he swapped the sensors from side to side, and after he swapped the sensors from side to side, the code stayed on the same wheel, and he tracked the wire harness and found a broke wire. So he didn't actually buy a part, he actually swapped the parts around, see, because both of them would fit either wheel, and that was a smart way to do that, right? Okay, and so that's another right here for it is, you know, on that. Now, different styles of wheel speed sensors, you know, this is the wire wrapped around the magnet, like I was talking about, when the tooth passes, magnetic field shield voltage created. This is our little scope. We did it out here in the shop. That's what it looks like on this scope screen. Notice I got 20 milliseconds and one volt scale. And that's what you're getting right there on that little scope I was using at the time. Uh, a lot of your uh, wheel uh, bearings will come with that sensor built in. So you can't even replace it. Sometimes you can replace the sensor. Sometimes you got to have the whole bearing. When the bearing goes bad, you got issues on that. So, you know, there's your little gear wheel and all that. That's another, you know, so on and so forth. All right, so your magneto-resistive versus variable reluctance. These sensors, see, I got them growing just alike, but on the inside of them, they're a little bit different. This one right here's got signal, power, and ground. So you got, if it's a Hall effect sensor, it creates a digital signal that looks like that. If it's an analog signal, it looks like that. Yeah. Now this right here is like the sensor on this uh, Taurus engine up here. It's a variable reluctance sensor, and so every time it moves, and this is for your electronic stuff too. You know, you're learning something here. So basically, that's what your two signals are going to look like uh, when you got those. Now this right here, and I'm going to show you another picture of that later, has a tendency whenever you're just barely moving, the amplitude is not very high on this. Now what I'm saying by that is, when you're talking about an analog signal, amplitude is how tall these mountains are. Frequency is how close these mountains are together. So you've got amplitude and frequency on a signal like this. Now you can ace it. the amplitude on this is always going to stay the same. <coughs> From here to here is always going to be the same voltage, but the frequency will change. You got me? And even if you're moving that wheel very slow, it's going to switch up and down like that. And the computer loves that, by the way. The computer loves the one. It actually has to take the analog one and convert it to something digital so it can use it. The computer does. All right. Hall effect sensors on Dodge Caravan, 7 to 14 milliamp switch. Vehicle speed can be calculated more accurately even at really slow speeds with a digital sensor. But you notice, this is a digital signal, but it's only got two wires going to it. It doesn't have three wires, it's only got two. And the Dodge Caravan, that gray one that we inspect every month, that is the deal, you've got to put a window regulator uh, in that one on the driver's door. I've already got the part over here. In the, we got to make sure that you're up against the end of the day where you're under the gun where you'll have to do it really quick because you'll need it right. I mean, we'll give it to you 45 minutes before quitting time and you'll have to finish it in that bit of time. That puts you under pressure and maybe prepares you for the real world, okay? All right. All effects into a little Dodge Caravan. It's basically your little rundown on it. You got a haul element, you got a magnet, uh, and the vehicle. It's, it's basically, it's giving you the same thing a little bit more. And this is kind of what it looks like when you look into that connector. It's not hard to look into that connector and tell which one is positive and which one is negative. If you unplug it, you'll measure 12 volts going to that one actually on the, on the caravan that I was talking about a minute ago, the digital output. And so this is what it looks like. Now it's actually, in spite of the fact that it's switching 7 to 14 milliamps, you can connect your little scope to it and you can look at the voltage. Just basically go in there and look at your volt. I got it on one and a half volts in 100 milliseconds. We could turn that wheel by hand watching this. You can even hook your regular voltmeter up to it. And I'm talking about it's got to be hooked together. You got to be going into the wire. So you're not actually, we, with it, these aren't unplugged when you're doing that. I just did that so you can see. But you got to have it together when you go into those two wires, back program, whatever. And then you can turn that thing and watch this change. The voltage will deflect. So you can get an idea of whether it's working or not, even though you're not reading 7 to 14 milliamps. You can actually plug in and read the, one of the well, yellow voltmeters and see it. If you don't see any activity or when you're turning the wheel, what do you know? You know the sensor's bad, right? All right, that ain't real complicated. Now, here's another magneto-resistive sensor picture right here, the one that I just showed you. If you've got damage or cracked teeth or whatever, all right, if you got, this is normal. And if you've got cracked teeth, you so you have a little extra wiggle in there, like if a tooth has got a crack running across it and all. Uh, if you got one that's blocked with something that's ferrous metal, particularly like what would be like your 
when you're machining the rotors, you know, you'll have stuff in there. If it's blocked, you'll have wind up with a, a one that's too wide and all that. Uh, now the damaged one is just basically showing if this right here is wider, see where it's damaged, it will make that wider than it's than normal. That's what they're talking about there. And so this right here is the stuff. It's looking for all of them to be nice and uniform, and if some of them are wider than others, it's subject to throw you a code. Now this is the guts on the inside. A little bit later I'll have you guys actually build one of these from scratch. I'm kidding actually. But uh, the single chip sensor, the magnets in there, there's your magnetic resistance element. And this is in the bearing cover. Alternate the south and north and south pole magnets. So that whenever that thing's going by there, you got this little constant voltage circuit. You got a transistor in there and a comparator. A magnet, and then there's your output. So, you know, but so what you're looking at on the inside of that on the MRE one is like that. And this is what's really cool. You see them on bearings? Did you know they had those little magnets in them? Not all bearings have got that, but if it's got ABS and it's using those like that, it'll have these little magnets in there. And these places, these things, this little thing is just a piece of cardboard with some little iron, iron filing between some plastic stuff. And see how that one is showing a bad one? Would you be able to look at that bearing and tell if that was bad without that? You wouldn't, would you? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a bad one. And so that means that bearing would need to be replaced because those magnets are actually built into that cover. You got that? Some bearing manufacturers make these tools available for free or for a very reasonable price. There was an article, there was a copy of Motor Age that came out a while ago, and I think it was an article in it that I wrote also, actually came with one of these staple, I mean, those stuck inside the magazine where you could have one. You know, I don't even know where it is now, though. Uh, analog signal fades at low speed. See how the slower you go. Now you can have, can have these set up so that it can tell. See, this tells you how fast it's going right here. And it, you know, when you, you can get it slow enough to where it don't even know it's moving, even though it's moving a little slow. But on the other one that's digital, it tells you when it's moving a whole lot better. This one here can tell which way it's moving. If it's moving backwards or forwards. I don't know why to do that. Okay, going forward, it goes high first, puts out a square wave. On the, going backwards, it's a modified square wave. See that? If it sees one like that, which is a crazy thing because it's, a, it's got on and it's got partially off, you know, it's a strange signal. But that's how it can basically tell if it's going backwards or forward. If it's going backwards, it's going to look different. And they could, you know, the ECU knows. Now sometimes, and I've seen this two or three times. As a matter of fact, it wasn't aftermarket. The first time I ran into it, Back in the day, you know, the, the Ford used IDS now. You know, we got an IDS here. Well, the IDS, uh, before it was the IDS, it was a WDS. Before that, we had an SBDS, uh, which was all diagnostic system. A worldwide diagnostic system was basically a glorified laptop that was sitting on a little thing right here. And it, and it looked just like the interface for the IDS, and the same program was there. All right, so I was working on this Mazda that had analog brake code. And I was looking at the signals, and uh, one of the signals was there, and the other one wasn't. So I worked, 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 worked on the left front wheel, and I found out that whoever wrote the software wrote it wrong, and it was telling me it was the left front wheel that was bad, and it was, and it was actually the right front wheel that was bad. I saw that also here with one of our scan tools on this Dodge. It kept lying to me about the thing. It was telling me the left one was bad, and then my buddy out there has got a DRB3, which is what Chrysler uses. And when he plugged that thing in, it told him the truth about which sensor was bad. And that threw us, you know, whenever you keep working on the left rear wheel, when actually the right rear wheel is the bad one, the tool can lie to you. So make sure you check them all if you're in doubt. Like let's say you put another sensor on there and it still didn't fix it, it's still throwing you the same code, you know your wires are good. It may be another sensor entirely. It, would be, it won't even be side to side though, it won't usually go front to back that I've ever seen. Now when you don't know how to troubleshoot, money and time go into a black hole. That's what a black hole looked like. Last time I visited one, that's what it looked like. Okay. All right. So a typical ABS system, on most ABS systems, the driver will sense a pulsation in the brake pedal. You felt that. Accompanied by a slight up and down movement in the pedal height during ABS system operation. On some of them, when you're driving away from a stop, it will decide at about 20 miles an hour to test the ABS pump. You'll drive away and you ain't even touching a brake and at about 20 miles an hour you may feel the ABS pump go boom. I don't know if you ever heard that before, some Crown Victoria will do it. Uh, they won't all do it, but like I say, yeah, and a lot of times uh, if you're working on one with ABS and all, you may have to use a scan tool to turn on that hydraulic control unit to get the air out of the ABS. 
where you won't ever get it all bled. So look in your book if it says brake bleeding. If it tells you to get a scan tool and you know to, and turn on the uh, hydraulic control unit and play, you know, have a bleed function, you know, in there. Look at that. This mechanical noise may be heard in the passenger compartment during the operation of pump motor solenoids. All right, this is what a hydraulic control in a basic hydraulic control unit looks like. Now these right here are the little cores of these solenoids, and they're this this box here is actually slides down over these and the little electromagnetic <coughs> coils are going to move those whenever it's telling them to operate. Wire harness connection will be here. Some of you might have seen that. I thought I had one of these over here somewhere. I mean the uh, electronic control unit. But I know back there I've got an ABS uh, unit. Big old ugly thing down there somewhere. Um, of course you've seen it before. Yeah. You know, ain't no big deal. I was going to hold it up in front of the camera. But I mean, it's, all you're doing is you're looking at this right here. Now, I will tell you this. They don't all look exactly alike, and they're not always mounted in the same place. On a van, it'll usually be mounted in the engine compartment and a lot of cars. On pickup trucks, it may be mounted halfway back down the frame rail. Big old hydraulic control unit. And one like for this 2001 Chevrolet truck out here, runs about $1,200 now. And so you've got to be careful whenever you're condemning one of these. One time on a motorhome, I had to replace one of these... Uh, ECUs right here, this uh, computer part of it. And after I replaced it, the speedometer wouldn't work, and then I realized it was a programmable module, and I had to take the data from the old module, load it into the new one, and fix it so the speedometer worked. Uh, a lot of times the ECU is a clearinghouse for the vehicle speed. If it comes from the rear end, it'll go through the ECU, and the ECU will align it, define it, and send it out to the other modules that need. That doesn't happen all the time. You gotta know how each, each particular vehicle is wired up. When the ECU determines the traction existence required, the isolation valves close, the pump motor runs, providing brake fluid pressure, only the brakes are in one drive wheel. How many of you ever drove off uh, down here in Alabama somewhere, you're pulling up off the road or anywhere else, or if you're an ice, and the right rear wheel just goes, uh, just spinning up a storm. You know, if you're, on slick, if you're in slick mud, or if you're on wet grass, or something like that, the right rear wheel just spinning something fierce. And, uh, you know, and a lot of times if it's moving a little bit, you say, well, I don't want to let off the gas. I'll stop and I may get stuck. You know, well, I done on my dad's 66 Chevy truck one time and the engine started knocking. That made me, a, got me in a lot of trouble. And I was just a teenage boy at the time. But the thing about it is, if you, uh, if you could, if you ever have a truck on a lift, and let's say that you've got, whenever you're running the engine with it in gear on the lift because you're listening for a bearing noise or something, the right rear wheel will usually be the one that will turn and the other one will just sit there. You ever mm -hmm. seen that? Yep. on the lift. All right, so how do you stop the right rear one so that other one will turn you and listen to the bearing on that side? Because if you can stop the one on that side, it'll go the other way. But what you can do is you grab the park brake cable. And when you pull the park brake cable on that side, it'll stop that wheel and the other one starts spinning and then you can hear it. Well, think about your traction control. Your traction control is actually able to just drive fluid to the right rear if it's the one that's slipping and it will force tor torque to go the other one that's got better traction. That's what traction control does. It allows the HCU to limit the rotation of the driving wheels and provide better traction on slippery surfaces. Now this is kind of a schematic of what's going on here. Everybody knows what this is. Anybody don't know what that is? You guys ought to know what it is because y'all had your hands all over one, had not you? Nicholas over about to turn into a skeleton. When the brakes are applied during normal stops, the fluid is forced from the bank brake master cylinder outlet port down. You know, this ain't complicated. It goes, this is just like everything's at rest, like it's supposed to be. It's going, it doesn't go in here, it's coming down here, going through there. Whenever you see those two arrows right there, it means that it can pass both ways. Whenever the arrows are up here, it means that it's blocked. Now, these are your two little solenoids isolation valve, outlet valve. Go into the brake caliper or in the wheel cylinder or wherever. And it's just like an old brake system. What determines that when the wheel is danger of locking up is the wheel rotation speed and deceleration rate of the other wheels. So it's looking at all of them at the same time. But if one of them is slowing down more than the rest of them, that's when it goes into action. It'll use the isolation solenoid to block fluid pressure to the sliding wheels. Okay, so it has already blocked this one. See, it's moved that arrow up there. And it's blocked it. Now that's blocked and that's blocked and the fluid is trapped here. It can't go anywhere. The pressure is trapped there and it's still got the brake applied. If that thing is continuing to slide, see it wants to help, let that tire keep trying to help you stop, 
but it literally doesn't want it to stop turning. That's what it's basically looking at. All right, if the wheels are still sliding, it opens the outlet valve and releases the pressure that's trapped in the silk caliper or wheel cylinder, and the wheel begins to turn again, and that prevents the drop loss of driver control. So basically, that solenoid opens, and it goes up here. It's basically at the pump in the motor, but the pump in the motor ain't doing anything yet. All right, you got that? There, you got a reservoir there. I want to call that an accumulator, okay? All right, myself. All right, so the ABS pedal switches normally close during braking, but when the pressure has been released, the switch opens because it's actually causing it to, you know, this to release like it like it would if you're uh, if you had a brake fluid leak or something. All right, and so this is still open, but now the pump is replenishing that. So that that's what you're feeling. Da, 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 you know what I'm saying? As the pump kicks on and these solenoid machines going back and forth, when the brake pedal travel exceeds the ABS pedal switch setting during the ABS stop, the contact's open. And it senses the switch is open, fires up the pump, and the accumulator helps too because it's got fluid pressure stored in it, right? And that keeps something going on until the brake can be applied without the risk of wheel lockup. Not that complicated, right? On dry pavement, the valve might only cycle once or twice to prevent the wheel lockup. But on ice, it may cycle as many as 12 times per second to stop them from locking up. All right. ABS components are also used in traction control and stability control. You ever see any stable track vehicles? And it'll say that on the thing of vehicle stability systems. And if you're going around here and it's actually noticing which, whether the vehicle is starting to slide, it will apply just one of the brakes automatically without you having to do anything because the vehicle is stable out, you know, to keep you from sliding out of control. That's what this little thing right here is for. All right, so you got driver input, steering column, torque sensor, steering angle sensor. Torque sensor is how hard you're turning that steering angle is where it's at. And there's your vehicle speed sensor, and then you got a motor for your power assist. And then there's your traction control, stability control, that's all that stuff. Now, here's the test. Hope you paid attention. All right. You know, that guy's not a smiley face. Huh? So the test is on what we did not. That's right. Mm -hmm. If you weren't sleeping. Were you sleeping? Uh, I was done. All right. You got your answer sheet ready. Which of the following components is used to control anti-lock brake system operation? <laughs> we got five minutes to get through this. All right, we got 30 seconds for each question. Oh, man. <laughs> Anti-lock brake system prevents wheel lockup by controlling the brake pressure during an emergency stop. By not locking the wheel during hard braking, the driver can A, maintain vehicle directional control. B, stop the vehicle in the shortest possible distance. C, maintain traction during the stop. And D, all of the above answers are correct. Applied hard enough to cause a lockup situation, the ECU sends command signals where? Which ABS component is used to cut fluid flow off from the master cylinder to the brake? It's between the master cylinder and the brake on the pressure side. Outlet dump valve, inlet isolation valve, pump and motor assembly, or reservoir? Nicholas makes some funny faces. All right. What action is accomplished by opening the normally closed outlet dump valve? Pressure trap between the master cylinder and inlet isolation valve is relieved. Pressure trap between the brake and inlet isolation valve is relieved. Pressure trap between the reservoir and master cylinder is relieved. Pressure trap between the outlet dump valve and pump and motor is relieved. <coughs> Which of the following components is or are used to replenish the brake fluid in the ABS circuit after a dump occurs? ABS pedal switch reservoir, pump and motor, or all of the above entry is correct. I will tell you that 
I didn't write these questions, so or I didn't write most of them. I wrote them, <coughs> one, but I didn't write this one. Which ABS component is responsible for actuating pump and motor assembly operation? Closing the outlet dump valve, wheel speed sensor input, opening the ABS pedal switch, closing the fluid level indicator switch. Traction assist. Yeah. Yeah. On takeoff, it stops the spinning wheel, so torque will be delivered to the non spinning wheel. Traction assist has nothing to do with ABS. <coughs> it's all in the design of the differential. If the tires slide, they won't spin, so ABS helps prevent them from sliding. What? A, B, or C? During traction assist, what action is accomplished by closing the isolation valve? Traction assist. The hydraulic circuits of the drive wheel are isolated from the non-drive wheel. The hydraulic circuits of the brake units are isolated from the master cylinder pressure. The hydraulic units between the dump valve and the brakes will be open for fluid pressure. And finally, ABS operates more smoothly on a sporty car than it does on a four-wheel drive. True or false? All right, trade papers with somebody. Huh? What? Is there one you didn't answer or what? All right, we're going to whip through this right quick. We just got a short time, so let's make it happen, guys. Wait, okay. But you skipping the question number four. What do you mean skipping me? Huh? Well, it's not on the paper. On the answer sheet, it went one, two, three, five, six, seven. Yeah, well, I didn't write the answer sheet, so I screwed that up. Uh, you guys sort that out. You can make it happen. All right. Which of the following components is used to control any lock brake? Somebody tell me. Electronic. ECU. Hold on, wait. What was that? Which of the components is used to control any lock brake system? ECU. <coughs> An <coughs> anti-lock brake system prevents wheel lockup by controlling brake pressure during an emergency stop. That's all of the above. When the brakes are applied hard enough to cause a lockup situation, it says, what does it send command signals to? HCU. See, you guys are already doing stuff. Which ABS component is used to cut off fluid flow from the master shoulder of the brake? Inlet isolation valve. I don't know. What would that be? No, yeah. four. Inlet isolation valve. What action is accomplished by opening the normally closed outlet dump valve? What do you think? Pressure trap between the what? The brake and the inlet isolation valve, right? So you're basically wanting to let that pressure off so that wheel can start turning again. Which of the following components are used to replenish the brake fluid in the ABS circuit after a dump occurs? Now, this is really not a very well written question, but we're going to say pump and motor assembly, even though the reservoir helps a little. It should have been C. But if you put, you know, it wasn't going to be out. This one here doesn't do it right here. This doesn't replenish anything. Which ABS component is responsible for actuating the pump and motor assembly? 